Well, you, you weren't in Park City for the premiere of it, right? Yeah. So is this the first time you've seen it with the uh, audience? Um, the first time I saw it was at Rotterdam, actually, in January. Yeah. Um, Karen lives in London. Woo! Yeah. And Park City is very far from here. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so well, Rotterdam. Um, so, yeah, uh, any questions uh, from the audience? Get, yeah. Go ahead. It feels like the first American film I've ever seen where she goes through with the abortion. Feels like that was a real, I kept waiting for her to go, no, let's not do it. Because that's what always happens in America. Even Sex and the City, Miranda gets to the abortion clinic. She's going through with it and then, I can't do it. And it felt like, oh, that's a real departure. Was that a big piece of it for you? Oh, for sure. Uh, this was made in response to a lot of mainstream movies out there that are about unplanned pregnancy and, and in childbirth. I think great American movies that do that are Fast Times at Ridgemont High and Dirty Dancing. Um, but those storylines, that was just on the peripheral of, of the story. You know, We tried to make a film that was uh, authentic to, that ex to a young woman's experience, not just with unplanned pregnancy, but also life in general. Um, and uh, hopefully we, we accomplished that. <laughs> wasn't baby aborted? Baby was an abortion. No. No. <laughs> yeah, but it wasn't baby, right? It was the girl. It was Penny. Yeah, Penny. But it was like really scary because it was illegal then and it was like she almost died. And, yeah. That doesn't happen. Yeah, over here. Hi there. Um, I was just wondering, um, I was kind of surprised not to see the mother at the abortion. I was wondering what your thoughts were on that, why you didn't include her. I think the mom sort of insinuated that she was going to, she would be there. Um, whether it's physically there or helping her financially, they had their moment. Uh, Donna's character wanted to go with her best friend who had also had an abortion and was her her supporter and her champion. And um, But I think she and her mom had, had closure on that. Thank you. Plus, the mom's not that funny. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah, uh, up front, and then we'll come, go over there. Right here? Yeah. Uh, it's sort of a follow-up to what you were saying about, um, it's, well, it's a film where she goes through with the abortion where other films haven't done that. The, the whole film sort of goes against every sort of preconception you have about romantic comedies, um, which, to the point where, the, um, where Max is very understanding and accepting of everything that's going on. Uh, maybe you want to speak a bit more about that? Yeah, we, we really felt strongly about the Max character being uh, supportive and um, never being the obstacle. I think we're all brainwashed when we watch romantic comedies that the handsome <coughs> hunk with the flowers is going to save, rescue you, and you're going to get married, and we'll learn his name first, and then get married and uh, start this beautiful family, which is, uh, that's a great story. It's a story I've seen before, many, many movies. Um, but we wanted to show a different story that's a little bit more authentic and a nice, and still have that nice, handsome guy, but to the guy who's also going to be really supportive of the decision and, and hold your hand while you're going through it and have that moment in the recovery process and and, and maybe they'll, they will have a beautiful life together. Who knows? That's, that's a sequel. Um, but, you know, in this, in this moment, um, it's just about them on the couch and connecting in, together for that split second. Um, he has his moments, too. He freaks out a little bit. But ultimately, you know, he's a feminist. He's pro-choice. <laughs> yeah, we do. Question in the middle um, I was just wondering how much of the stand-up was improvised? Um, because it felt, kind of, it felt so lovely within the story, kind of, but especially the end scene where she's obviously talking about what she went through and, and such. I was just wondering how much of that was in the script and how much that came naturally during the production. Well, we tried to write some stand-up, um, and then Jenny 
Jenny is a stand-up comedian. That's sort of how we found her as an actress originally, was we saw her do stand-up probably like five or six years ago now. Um, and that's what she started doing. She's obviously a very talented um, you know, actress now who does a lot of things. But So she was involved definitely with, with a little bit of her own improvi improvising, but it was scripted as well. Question? So she was in the short as well, right? And, and do you want to talk a little bit about how you, did, how you approached her to, to be involved in this project? Be in our movie or else. Uh, basically, uh, we wrote the short in 2009, Karen, myself, and our best friend Anna Bean. I just love saying her name. Um, it's a power name. And we uh, wrote this film, and we're having a hard time looking to cast Donna. Uh, it was a, had to be a particular actress who was both charming and funny and had, you know, the comic timing and the zing, uh, but also had dramatic range. And we were not finding that person easily. Uh, but we used to go to this free comedy show in Williamsburg, Brooklyn. Uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of that place. And uh, she was up there uh, on stage with Gabe Liebman, her co-host, uh, who plays her best friend in the movie. And um, she's brilliant. She's very funny. She had all the range that we needed. And we, we sent her the script, and she said yes. And uh, this was before any acting role she had ever been in. She was just a stand-up and did a couple of VH1 like pop-up video type things. And later she got on SNL and then Parks and Rec and Kroll Show and House of Lies. And she's this wonderful character actress. But we saw something in her and I think she's always wanted to be a, a real actress and, ha and she has the range. But... She's also so good at, at those characters, those zany kind of bitchy characters that she plays normally. Um, but we all really decided to dive into this Donna character, and, and I think she did an amazing job. She's a wonderful actress. Yeah, nailed it. How much did you fund it on Kickstarter, and how much did you fund it traditional ways? Um, <clears throat> We were very traditional. We, we started with um, developing the script for a very long time, just taking our time, making sure everything was, all the fart jokes were perfected. Um, we had, at one point, 10 per page. <laughs> so we had to cut those down. Um, and we went out for grants first, and Rooftop, and San Francisco Film Society, and some other places that I'm blinded by this light, forgetting. Um, we got some great grants, and then we, we gave the script to a couple of um, lovely investors and production companies, and they connected to it. And we connected to them, and then we did some little finishing funds on Kickstarter, but mostly it was going to Sundance. We got the, the letter, the phone call, it's not a letter. Um, I had a heart attack at, at work when I got the call. And uh, we always wanted to do Kickstarter because the short did so well on the internet, um, Bust, Feministing, Jezebel, all these wonderful outlets wrote about the short, and we wanted to tell them uh, that we actually turned this into a feature. They didn't know, they, they, no one knew. So Kickstarter was a great platform for us to get um, just the buzz out before going, to, going into Sundance. And so we could also perfect the fart sounds. <laughs> great question uh, in the back now. What was, what was the inspiration, inspiration for, for the story, story and, and how, how much, much was, was it inspired by personal experience? Well, first of all, I don't know if everybody knows this, but, but in the UK, or not the UK, excuse me, in, in Britain, Great Britain, 75% um, of the residents, I looked this up last night, think abortion is okay to be legal. And in the US, it's much smaller. It's very much right down the middle. Um, and there's a lot more debate. It's been legal since Roe v. Wade in 73, I think. Um, but uh, it's been very much state by state, and every state, well, not every state, but a lot of states are trying to impose like very specific legislation that like prevents women from getting abortions when they want them. Like They make them get counseling. They make them wait a certain amount of time between when they find out they're pregnant and they're like, yes, I want an abortion. They're like, well, you have to wait 48 hours before you can have it. So like all these restrictions are in place. So like. That really was the inspiration um, 
to do this was to sort of just like get sort of consciousness raising to get people to realize that like this is a thing that women need to do and are should be allowed to do um, and you know it's personal in that we're women and you know one in three women statistically right have had abortions at some point in their life so I mean that's it's personal in that way yeah another question in the middle then good Um, just following on from that, do you think that having the characters as hipsters, sorry to use that term, but that's essentially what it is, um, will alienate that 50% of America that are against abortion because it becomes an alternative decision for alternative people? I mean, I mean, probably. I mean, we, I mean, we weren't trying to necessarily you know, we're not going to change the opinions of like extreme pro-lifers in like, the middle of the United States with this film. Maybe, hopefully, like that'd be great. But I mean, to some extent, there's some preaching to the choir. But I think that's okay as long as you know, it's a trickle-down effect. You have to start small, you know, and hope that it'll expand and reach, you know, greater audiences and greater people, and and just spread the message. Yeah, and uh, to ignite a conversation. Um, Hipster, not hipster, I don't, you know, what's a skinny jean anyway? Um, I feel like what we set out to do was tell one woman's story in an, in an honest way and to ignite a conversation. And if we get to, if that happens, then, then we're happy. And to her point earlier, it, it still hasn't been seen, I haven't seen it before. So, you know, in that sense, it's very fresh. Um, yep, right up there. Have you had much backlash for the film, or and given the subject matter, did you have difficulty securing finance? Uh, no difficulty uh, securing finance, and um, the movie isn't out yet. Right now we're living in this wonderful bubble of, of film festivals. Um, it's really safe, and it's, it's, a, it's like a womb. Um, but um, we're really excited to share it with uh, the world on August, uh, August, no, August is coming out in the UK, end of August in the UK, uh, June 6th in the United States, New York, LA, and then 30 markets, and then all over the world, and then <coughs> iTunes and Netflix, and, and we'll see what happens if I have to, you know, change my name. <laughs> is it something that you've actually prepared for? I'm not changing my name, <laughs> but, um, I'm, I'm prepared. I, I guess maybe I'm naive, but I, I don't I, I don't think I'm going to be under attack. I think women's reproductive rights are under attack, but I don't think this story is going to um, be harmful to, to the to the filmmakers. Maybe we have time for one more question. Anyone has one? Yeah, all the way. Uh, we'll do these two. We'll do it in the back. I'll, we'll start on the side here, and then we'll end with you in the back room. Um, I just wanted to ask about the music. At what stage did um, Paul Simon and the movie title come into play, and how was it getting him to approve it? Um, Uncle Paul, I like to call him. No, <laughs> it's a joke I keep on saying. It never gets laughs. I'm not related to Paul Simon. Karen is not related to Paul Simon. Uh, we used the song in the short. Uh, it was always, it just started with this scene in our brains. We wanted to take a song that was so important in our childhoods. I used to listen to Rhythm of the Saints and Graceland in the car on family vacations, kicking my dad's seat. But um, really just, you know, I just stopped listening to it. And then when I revisited it in my 20s, I had a whole new perspective of the song. And this one in particular, uh, it, it's so sad and uplifting at the same time. It, it has all the, my favorite, qualities in, in a song and in a feeling, so I had, we had to put it in this movie and put it to a striptease sex scene. Um, and then the title really came after. I know it makes it sound like dum-dums, but um, the song came first, the title came second, and then Begging for Rights came third. And, and he was a fan of the short, um, and he's a, a good friend of the film. Now, last question in the back in the middle there.
it was a very similar question, at which point the other music choices came into the film, like the single girl song. Oh, yes, I, the Carter family. Um, my fiance composed the score, not that song, but uh, the score in the movie uh, was composed by my fiance. Um, a lot of the bands that we used were our friends' bands, who are Brooklyn based bands. And the Carter family song was just a song that uh, was so sweet and love, love them, and I don't know them personally. <laughs> Uh, but it, you know, it just uh, felt right for the scene. Um, so um, we, yeah, can, no, I was just talking about mixtapes. So. <laughs> yeah, that's another time. I'd like to know about time. mixtapes. Oh, yeah. All right. Well, um, please uh, tell all of your friends to go see the film when it comes out in August. Um, and just another warm round of applause for the creators. <laughs>